Welcome to the Ward 1 Budget Town Hall. Continuing the practice Mayor Gray started at the beginning of his administration, the mayor will brief district residents ward by ward on his proposed budget for the coming year. I am pleased to have the opportunity to introduce the mayor. As he presents his fiscal year 2015 budget tonight, I believe you will see a fiscally responsible budget that makes a historic investment in public education, leverages the district's continued strong fiscal stability to build on early investments in affordable housing and workforce development, and improves the quality of life for all district residents. Please join me in welcoming Mayor Vincent C. Gray. Man, after that introduction, I'll vote for the budget. <laughs> thank you very much, Juan, and good evening, everybody. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming out. Uh, I want to thank all of our, the members of our administration who are out. This is the seventh ward that we've been in. And I guess the real reward is we got one more to do, uh, Ward 5. And we're doing that, uh, is it Thursday? Thursday, Thursday, okay. We're doing that Thursday. And we got one tomorrow, the Office of Boards and uh, Commissions, right? In fact, I need to talk to you about that too, Eric. Yeah, okay. Um, you know, we, uh, for those of you who don't know, which would probably be maybe one person in the room, um, we have a relatively new Chief Financial Officer uh, who has joined us. Uh, many of you know that Dr. Uh, Nat Gandhi was the Chief Financial Officer for 13 years and worked in the uh, financial, the Office of Chief Financial Officer for a total of 16 years and uh, retired uh, just a few months ago. In fact, Dr. Gandhi was kind enough to stay on for 11 months after he uh, attended his resignation because we hadn't found someone at that point to be able to replace him. And frankly, the 11 months that we spent were well worth it uh, because we have found someone who is a true uh, expert, uh, someone who I enjoy working with every day and has been out on this road show with us uh, at each one of these uh, budget town hall meetings. And I want to give him an opportunity to come up and say a few words to greet you. And uh, I want you to get to know him, uh, especially as the months and years uh, wear on. Please join me in welcoming our relatively new CFO, Mr. Jeff DeWitt. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. It's a pleasure to be here today. Uh, it's probably about a year ago that I got a call from a recruiter about uh, taking a job in, in Washington, D.C., and uh, I told them no the first time uh, because I was uh, happy as a CFO in Phoenix, Arizona. Things are going pretty well there, and, and then I found out I had an opportunity to actually meet Alice Rivlin, so that's why I interviewed, and, uh, and now I'm here, and that's a true story. But uh, uh, I'm really enjoying uh, Washington, D.C. I live over at uh, 3rd and 8th Street. This was driving up 14th Street on the way up here. You see all the restaurants, all the things going on. And you can see the same thing starting to happen along 8th Street. So a uh, very great place to live, great place to work. I really, really am enjoying the job. And I think what you're going to see uh, from the mayor in just a few minutes is you will see a, a chart we call the Gandhi chart, the Dr. Gandhi chart, which shows that the reserves are the highest levels that they've ever been in the history of the city. You'll also see high bond ratings which is a testament to his leadership over the years. And, and I'm honored to, to come in after him and have the opportunity to take the CFO's office to the next level in many different areas, technology and, and customer service and, and all types of other issues that we're working through, a strategic plan for our office that we'll be uh, rolling out in probably the next 60 days uh, of all the things we're gonna get done uh, during the next five years. Uh, so you're gonna see things that, uh, uh, like affordable housing and schools and, and things like that in the budget. And one of the most telling statistics that I've run into since I've been the CFO is we were preparing the revenue forecast back in February, which really drove a lot of the, uh, the initiatives you see in this budget is, five years ago, about a third of the revenue earned in the district stayed in the district. And five years later, about 45% of the revenue earned in the district stayed in the district. In other words, the District of Columbia has become a place to live, not just a place to work. And that's an incredible transformation that takes schools and transportation systems and affordable housing and all those types of things. And so uh, it's a great honor to be coming in at this time with all the dynamic things going on, all the cranes up, all the, all the development going on, and all the changes are going on in the District of Columbia. I'm honored to be here. 
Uh, I've been out in the community, and if you ever have any community groups that would like to, for me to talk to them, I'd be glad to do that. I'm listening, and we're getting ready to do a lot, of, uh, a lot of things in the CFO's office, technology and things coming forward. So again, thank you. It's an honor to be here, and thank you, Mayor Gray, and, and uh, thank you all for, for, uh, for welcoming me into the District of Columbia. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much, uh, Jeff. We want to go through the budget, and then those who may have questions will be happy to uh, take the opportunity to try to answer them. Um, there is a PowerPoint, um, and some of you may have copies of it, some of you may not, some of you may have memorized it uh, by now, and if you have, forgive, uh, for, uh, for, forgive me for having subjected you to that. Um, the theme of our budget this year is keeping promises, and it's very appropriate because we made a number of promises uh, when I came into office uh, in 2011, and we have really worked diligently to try to keep those promises. Uh, some of them are multi-year uh, efforts that, um, you know, we know have to, have to transcend fiscal years and move from one fiscal year uh, to the next. And um, that's what you will see in this budget. Uh, anything that's a vision is not going to be a one-year uh, commitment. It's going to be a multi-year commitment, and virtually everything that's in this budget is a multi-year uh, commitment. So, again, that's why the theme, keeping promises, is the appropriate one uh, for this budget. Now, um, we have tried to do something that I promised from the very uh, beginning, and that was to be able to maintain uh, fiscal responsibility uh, in what we do. Uh, what does that mean? It means that we, we promise to have a structurally sound budget uh, every year. What is a structurally sound budget? It is a budget uh, in which you don't spend more money than comes in the door. I don't know how to put it any more simple uh, than that. And we saw budgets uh, prior to coming in uh, in which we uh, actually uh, had uh, going, people going into the bank account and spending money uh, that uh, was in the bank account. And we were given uh, a lot of difficulty by our Wall Street uh, rating agencies because we, in fact, uh, had done that. Uh, we also have preserved the uh, debt cap of 12 percent, uh, and I'm proud that we've been able to do that. And there are no new taxes and no new fee increases uh, in this budget. Uh, and I'm really proud of that, too. We, we've only done that. We did that the first year because we wanted to have a, a structurally sound budget. Once we got past that, uh, we haven't had to do that uh, anymore. Um, before I go further uh, into the next chart, I see we've been joined by our Ward 1 uh, council member, and I want to uh, not only acknowledge his presence, but I want to ask Councilmember Jim Graham if he would come up and say a few words before we go any further. Councilmember Graham, we're glad to have you tonight. Well, I, I just have, I'll be very brief. I just have two points I'd like to make. Uh, Mr. Mayor, first, thank you for a terrific budget. Terrific budget. I suppose you've already received a lot of applause. Can we thank the mayor? And not only. <laughs> Not, not only for a good budget document, but also, you know, he's, he's done this in every, he's doing this in every ward. You've been to most of the wards now, haven't you? Yeah, we're, we only have one left. Right, so, well, the first will be last and the last will be first. <laughs> Think about that a minute. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, no, I, and, and this is the first mayor that's done this is to go out to every single ward with a special meeting. And I, I just want to know, that you, uh, I want you to know how much this is appreciated. Two points very quickly. Number one, uh, you and I are working together on some of the pressing homeless issues, which I know mean a lot to people everywhere in the city, in every ward, that we're doing the right thing by families and by children, and that we don't want children growing up in bus stations and stairwells, or for that matter, in D.C. general. Uh, it's just not working. It's not working. So we've got to provide quality housing. And in fact, uh, I'm having two hearings on this tomorrow, Mr. Mayor, uh, the second of which is with Director Burns. The second thing is I want to express just a, a bit of disappointment, a bit of disappointment that no one ward school is in the 2015 capital budget. Now, we've had great success. We've had great progress. Cardozo, H.D. Cook, other schools come to mind, but we don't have Garrison, we don't have uh, Bruce Monroe at Parkview, which really, really, we're going to get some good uh, 
uh, ADA compliance renovations this summer, but I want to work with you to include more of our Ward 1 schools in the budget for capital programming in 2015. We have so many engaged parents, so many concerned community members about this issue. And I know Garrison stands tall on this, but so does Bruce Monroe at Parkview. We need, we need this, the second stage of those renovations, at least in part, to be moved up. And perhaps some kind of, I think they, the budget, Mr. Goulet, I think you called them special projects. But I would like to work very hard with you to see if we can't get a special project at Parkview, or Bruce Monroe at Parkview in 2015. But with that said, I, I want to thank everybody for being here tonight. You know, it's, it's difficult to schedule an important meeting on a beautiful day. You should avoid it at all costs. <laughs> But even, even with all the things that you know, Mr. Mayor, you, you can't predict this. Thank you all very much for coming. I promise that the District of Columbia will have these meetings in the future only on torrentially, you know, rainy days. <laughs> and you know everybody will come out, right? <laughs> Thank you, Jim, for coming out and being a part of this. I think you've been with us uh, each year uh, that we've done this. So thank you very much for coming tonight. And we look forward to working with you as we move toward the uh, concluding stages uh, of the budget. Um, the next chart that you will see, we call it Gandhi's chart. And what it does is over a period of 20 plus years is track the district's bank account. Uh, how much money do we have in the bank? And um, this uh, shows a, uh, in the early days, back in the uh, early 90s, it shows a pretty dismal uh, picture that then started to get better uh, around 1998 and went up uh, to the point where that we actually had in the bank about one and a half billion dollars and then there was a period uh, thereafter uh, when the city uh, spent down substantially uh, the bank account. And uh, what I inherited when I came into office was what you see in 2010. And along with that, I inherited some warnings from our rating agencies that we could not continue to spend money in the bank account, from the bank account, and call it a balanced budget, because it was not, from their perspective, a balanced budget. And so we were, uh, we were potentially about to get our bond ratings uh, downgraded. Uh, let me welcome also Councilmember uh, Frank Smith, uh, former Ward 1 council member who is here with us tonight. Thank you, Frank, for coming out. Appreciate it. And um, we were told that we needed to come up with structurally balanced budgets. Uh, and if we didn't, we were going to potentially be downgraded. We were put on negative outlook, uh, which means that we were moving towards the downgrading. And so we begged, uh, we did everything. I think I was in what, Eric, within two weeks, uh, three weeks, four weeks of being sworn in. We were up there um, getting the uh, riot act uh, read to us about the uh, condition of our finances in the District of Columbia. And I said to our folks when I came back, I said, we're gonna get this straightened out. Um, and we have. And what you see uh, from 2010, uh, 11, 12, 13, is an increasing uh, in amount in our bank account. We now have in the bank, we have the highest amount that the District of Columbia has ever had in the bank in the history uh, of our city. One million, one billion, seven hundred and fifty million dollars. Um, and please don't ask me the question, why don't we spend all that money? Because uh, it'll take me an hour to give you an answer, because a lot of that money is committed to a variety of things. Um, but suffice it to say, it has given us a wonderfully uh, credible reputation uh, on Wall Street at this stage. And we're now making arguments as to why we should be upgraded, not why we shouldn't be downgraded. So. Um, we are at $1.75 billion. I'm very proud of it, and we hope that by the end of this fiscal year, maybe we'll be able to increase that um, even uh, further. Now, each year we go into the uh, budget, uh, we have what's called a baseline budget, and it projects what it would cost to be able to do the same services that you did the previous year, and then how much money you have to do that. And that's where we get this gap from. And the first year that we did, our, uh, did a budget, we had a gap between, okay, if you guys want to continue to do the same things that you did last year, and here's the money that you have, 
Here's what the gap is, $322 million, and we managed to close that gap. And then the following year, the gap went down. It was projected pretty high again, $172 million, uh, but we met that gap. We closed that gap as well. The following year, it went to 20, uh, 79, excuse me, $0.3 million. And then this past year, the current year, as we went into this budget, the projected gap, which I think is unprecedented, was only $2.7 million. And then we got some news from the chief financial officer uh, after that that we would have, I think, another $137, $139 million, something like that, which obviously helped us close the gap. And then we had money to be able to invest in additional services uh, for uh, the city, which is how we balance the budget for uh, the current year. Um, the, the next slide that you see uh, is one that looks at what the approved budget is for the current year, uh, local budget, from our money. Anybody know where our money comes from? Where does our money come from? And I don't mean the federal government, y'all. I'm talking about the money that we raise ourselves. Three big sources. Anybody know what that is? Income taxes. That's right. That's exactly right. If I had a prize, I'd give it to you. And we do have prizes, too, which we'll, we'll give those out later. It's real estate taxes, uh, we call them property taxes, income taxes, and sales taxes. And as you will see shortly, that accounts for probably about, I don't know, 75, 80 percent of the money coming uh, in the door. So our budget, local budget for this year is $6.35 billion. Um, the uh, baseline expenses. Uh, which uh, would be what's projected, I guess, to do the same thing, Eric, if we did last year, it would cost us then $6.64 uh, billion. Uh, I'm not going to go into the next few things because it's, you know, it, I don't know if anybody really cares anyway. Uh, but our proposed budget at a local level for next year is $6.796 seven hundred and ninety million dollars. Uh, we've been able to add to that a new policy areas, some of which I will talk about, two in particular I will talk about. Um, it is a, what, 2.3 percent increase over the uh, current year uh, budget. And for those of you who are interested in it, we had a population that grew by 2.1 percent since last year. Now, what relationship that has to the 2.3 percent, I have no idea, but it sounds good. It sounds like there's a relationship there. So in any event, 2.3 percent increase in the budget, 2.1 percent increase in the population uh, in the city, which is growing at about 11 to, 12, 11 to 1,200 people uh, a month. The next slide um, shows you where the money goes. The lion's share of our money, uh, the lion's share of the money being spent, I should put it that way, goes to human services. Uh, that's about 40 percent, uh, four billion plus dollars. And then the next largest amount is public education. And that is um, about two billion dollars. Uh, so between human services and public education, we spend 60 percent of the money. And you know what? That's probably never going to change. Uh, because we, we work hard to meet human need, and of course we obviously all want to be able to educate our children uh, in the District of Columbia and give them the best possible education that we can, and you'll see how we are increasing that uh, shortly. The only other thing I want to mention is some of the best money I think is spent in the District of Columbia. You notice the little uh, slice of the pie that says uh, economic development, 0.47. That means we spend $470 million on economic development in the city. And that helps to drive where all this money comes from. Uh, it helps to drive the increases in sales taxes. It helps to drive the increases in property taxes. And it helps to drive also attracting more people to the District of Columbia who then pay more income taxes when they come in. So probably some of the best money we spend uh, in this budget in helping, helping to generate what we need to be able to run uh, the city. The next slide shows you where the money comes from. Uh, and I've already talked about the, the, the blue one that's up there, the big blue slice, and that is um, the uh, local funds, the money that we, you know, from property taxes, et cetera. And then the other big item is from uh, Medicaid. Uh, Medicaid, the federal government, supports 70% of our expenditures on the Medicaid program. 
We have a very generous Medicaid program in the city. Medicaid actually works in two ways. There's a, if, you, if you have a Medicaid program, which I guess most states do, there may be one or two that don't uh, at this stage. Uh, I don't know, does Arizona have a Medicaid program? It does. It didn't have one for a long time, did it? It did not. It did. Well, you thought about getting rid of it, okay. Uh, I know Virginia doesn't have the most generous uh, Medicaid program, um, but you know, certain services you have to provide if you provide Medicaid program, but after that, they're called optional services. And I think we provide now almost every optional service that there is. It makes us one of the most generous uh, states, if you will, in providing Medicaid services. So we get from the federal government $2 billion. That's the 70 percent. And then the other 30 percent, which you can figure that out, will take us up to about, I don't know, probably about close to $3 billion that we spend on Medicaid uh, alone. Uh, now, there are four pillars in this budget. Continuing improvements in public education, uh, investing in affordable housing, uh, encouraging uh, continued economic development. Anybody seen any cranes in the city uh, recently? Jeff was just uh, alluding to those. Seen a few cranes around? Mr. City Administrator, I would hope that you had seen them, sir, but, and, and I appreciate you raising your hand and let us know that you have. Uh, there's a lot of cranes. On any given day, we have anywhere from 50 to 65 cranes that are working to build things. And one of the things that you will notice is that now those cranes are starting to move out to the perimeter uh, of the city. There's a lot of development going on, not just in the downtown area, but going on in the outer areas of the city. Like Walter Reed, you'll see a lot of work going on. Um, uh, Skyland, uh, St. Elizabeth's. A lot of development going on there, and you're going to see more of that um, in the years ahead. Uh, and then uh, improving the quality of life for all, which is kind of an umbrella statement that uh, allows us to uh, put a lot of stuff under that. Now, first of all, in terms of education, uh, we are proposing to uh, invest $116 million additionally uh, in uh, education. Um, and. Uh, that will largely go to two places. It will go to uh, 112 million will go to DCPS and the public charter schools. How many of you all knew that every time we give a dollar to the DCPS, we have to give a dollar to the public charter schools? Because the, the, the law says that um, we have to invest, we have to invest in our children the same irrespective of where they may go to school. The charter schools get the same funding formula as the public school, D.C. public schools uh, do. And then we, when we provide an increase, <coughs> that increase has to go similarly to the public charter schools as it does to the D.C. public schools. So $112 million. We did an adequacy study. An adequacy study, what is that? Trying to figure out whether we are putting enough money into our public system to be able to educate uh, our children. So we're putting $60 million of the 112 uh, into that. And then um, of the 116, 4.2 million is going into early childhood education, uh, something that I believe is ultimately going to be uh, the best investment we will ever make uh, in this city. Uh, we're, at, we're putting $4.2 million into infant and toddler programs. Infant and toddler is defined as a child from birth but not having turned three years old uh, yet. And we now have, by the way, many of you know this, we now have the most robust pre-kindergarten program in America. We have 70% of our three-year-olds that go to school all day, every day, and we have 92% of our four-year-olds that go to school all day, every day. There is no state in America that can say that, and I'm very proud to be able to say it everywhere I go. And if people say they've already heard it, and I say, well, you just heard it again. Uh, because, we, you know, if we, if we were the opposite, if we were at the bottom of the barrel, nobody would have any problems reminding us uh, of that. Uh, I'm amazed at the meetings I go to. Now, I've been to some of these budget town hall meetings where people say, you know, when I go to North Dakota, their meetings work better than the ones in the District of Columbia. Or when I go to Virginia, or when I go to Wyoming, or when I go to Texas, I want to go like, have you ever been anywhere and said that the District of Columbia has something great going on? We, we, we somehow don't seem to have the commitment 
to take the pride in our own city, in our own state, and brag about what we do. As a matter of fact, we will complain about it and then say to somebody else somewhere else, I'm not even sure these people have ever been there, but say that it's going on better uh, in one of those places. So all I'm saying is that take pride in our city and stand up for our city and brag about our city everywhere you go. And what they're going to do, get mad at you? They don't know any different. I'm not suggesting that you not tell the truth. Yeah, tell the truth. But even if you weren't, they probably don't know the difference. But, you know, we got a great story to tell, ladies and gentlemen. We don't have to take any backseat to anybody at this stage. You know, I had a, uh, I had a visitor uh, yesterday to stop by my office, uh, the mayor of Atlanta. Uh, just stopped in yesterday because he won. He's, on, he, he's a graduate of Howard University and he's on the board of Howard. And so he's here a lot. And uh, he came and he wanted to ask me something about the uh, hospital. Uh, and because uh, Howard, of course, has a hospital. And he said, ask me a question. I said, what is it? He said, how have you all done this? He said, this city is absolutely on fire. How in the world have you all managed to do what you've done? Do all this building, improve education, getting people back to work, and uh, putting money in the bank the way you have? How have you all done this? And so I tried to answer the question, and it made me realize that if we got a mayor from another city that's acknowledging that, why the hell don't we get up and acknowledge it ourselves, ladies and gentlemen? Talk about ourselves so people understand that we do have a lot going on. Because the day is going to come when it won't be as good as it is now. So let's talk about it now. Let's brag about it now. Let's say all the good stuff now. And if people say, I don't want to hear it anymore, I say, fine, just leave. You don't have to stay around. Just leave. <laughs> You know, continuing on education, uh, we are pro proposing to put $2.8 million more into the public charter school facilities allotment. That will be, that will take us from what, about $3,000 to $3,100, uh, Eric? Um, and that will give us an inflationary increase because that's the way they, we have a capital budget that, like Council Member uh, Graham was alluding to earlier. They don't have a capital budget unless they construct one for themselves. So they get, in addition to what they get for student instruction, they get $3,000 right now per student per year. Uh, so you multiply that by the number of students, and that will tell you uh, how much money they get on top of their instructional money uh, in order to be able to, um, to uh, meet their capital uh, needs. So we're suggesting that this is a, a start to giving them some kind of increase uh, each year. Uh, this is an inflationary increase of about, uh, I don't know, 2 3%, something like that. Um, in addition to that, uh, the capital budget has $1.6 billion in it for citywide school uh, modernization. That's over a period of six years. And by the way, again, on the good news side, we are projecting a school enrollment. That is a charter schools and DCPS combined, we're projecting an enrollment of almost 87,000 students uh, next year, which will be the largest enrollment in public education in the District of Columbia in about 25 years. That is really good news, ladies and gentlemen. That means people are moving into the city, they are staying in the city, they are young families with young children, and they are increasing their confidence in public education, and it's being demonstrated in numbers uh, like this. Um, we're also putting uh, five million, proposing to put $5 million into our school nurse uh, program. Um, we are going to be able to say that our middle schools, and we hope to add to that, but our middle schools will have for, available to every student uh, technology opportunities, algebra, foreign language, art, physical education, and music. It'll be the first time in many, many years that those things have been available to every student in our middle schools or what we used to call our junior high schools. We are opening, we've been planning since last August, nine career and technical education academies uh, designed to serve each two to 300 students. Anybody remember when we used to have vocational education in this city? Anybody remember that? You mean to tell me y'all don't remember vocational? Don't y'all don't, ain't that young? Come on, don't even try me on that one, okay? <laughs> I'm not gonna bite on that one, all right? Y'all know, y'all remember vocational education. And the city got rid of it, like a lot of places did, uh, back in the 90s, and it was a mistake. Uh, the curricula weren't all that, you know, contemporary or current. 
Uh, so instead of just changing the curricula, we threw out the whole program. Got rid of the schools and everything. And you know what? The reality is we put a lot of kids in the street uh, as a result of that who couldn't find themselves in our public education system because not everybody wants to go to college right after high school. Uh, not everybody ever wants to go to college. And shouldn't we be equipping our students with a skill that they can go out and market and get a job? That's in everybody's best interest, ladies and gentlemen. And that's why we're opening nine career and technical education academies uh, in August. That will focus on three areas, information technology, the career ladder of construction uh, trades, um, and hospitality, which is a growing uh, area. Uh, I, 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 found, I heard some data today. Do you know how many visitors we had to the District of Columbia last year? Anybody know? If you do, you need a life. <laughs> we had 17.4 million visitors to the District of Columbia, and collectively they spent $6.7 billion that supported 76 thousand jobs in the District of Columbia. You're going to tell me that that's not a place where we are, some of our young people can find themselves? And it's the whole career ladder, all the way up to being able to manage hotels or be assistant manager in a hotel, manage restaurants. Um, we were down in, uh, a couple of months ago, uh, down in Shaw. I was there for the ribbon cutting of three restaurants, three brand new restaurants that opened. And then uh, a month later, I was back down there for the ribbon cutting on five new restaurants in one day. And with every one of those restaurants, there are jobs that are available to folks. So that's one of the areas that we're going to focus on, and that is hospitality that we know will create opportunities for our young people. We're putting $175,000 uh, in the budget to create uh, free SAT uh, opportunities for uh, our children. No child should not go to college because her or his family cannot pay for an SAT test. So every 11th grader, every 12th grader in the District of Columbia will have the SAT test paid for by the government. And won't that pay for itself, ladies and gentlemen, when these kids go to college, get a degree, and hopefully come back and work uh, in our city? And then we're opening, uh, we're proposing to open a new youth engagement center uh, also. We have s about 7,000 disconnected young people, ages 16 to 24 in the District of Columbia. And this is a center that will reach out to try to get them reconnected, get them reconnected to school, get them reconnected to uh, some type of uh, uh, career and technical education training, get them reconnected to society, because we all know what happens in situations like that. So many of those young people wind up getting in trouble. They wind up in the juvenile justice system or even wind up in the adult uh, criminal justice uh, system. We're proposing to put a million dollars into our truancy prevention program, $400,000 in a DC public library program called Sing, Talk, and Read, and $1.3 million uh, for an increase at the University of the District of Columbia, uh, which is an inflationary increase, and you're gonna see another increase uh, shortly. Uh, now, in terms of school modernization, we are proposing in 15 to put in $404 million, um, $174 million in the high schools, $40 million in middle schools, about $116 million in the elementary schools, and then uh, general improvements, right, Brian? And that's stuff like the ADA kind of compliance that uh, Councilmember Graham was talking about and then uh, other kinds of things that <clears throat> schools need in order to be able to continue to be upgraded, right? So uh -huh, $404 million just in fiscal year uh, 15 in those areas that I mentioned. Now, in terms of Ward 1, the schools that we're investing in uh, beginning this year, um, and I have to check, uh, we, I, I want to check on the uh, issue that Mr. Graham raised about what we have in 2015, uh, knowing how uh, detailed he is about reading the budget. I'm sure that he's right uh, in his uh, observation. But in 14 through 20, we're putting $67 million into Banneker, uh, Bancroft, $35 million, uh, $45.5 million into Marie Reed. Um, is, that, is, that, is that raising Marie Reed and uh, rebuilding it? I can't remember right now. Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, it's an open school. Yeah. Yeah, it looks like a bunker. So we're gonna, that's right. So we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna um, go through a real detailed planning process and design a more thoughtful uh, school for that site. 
Okay. And that's, that's, the, that's the 2200 Champlain right there at, uh, well, Adams Morgan, right? Adams Morgan, yeah. And then uh, Tubman, which of course is over on uh, 13th Street. Uh, Adams uh, Elementary School, $12 million. And then Washington Metro uh, Elementary School, $9.9 .9 million. Where's that located? Where's, where's Washington Metro? Okay, anybody know right offhand? Where is it, Frank? Go ahead. By how, oh, yeah, okay, sure. Yeah, okay, gotcha. Okay, thank you, Frank. That's Frank Smith's bowling place. <laughs> All right, the second pillar is affordable housing. Is there anybody in here that would argue that our city has not become quite expensive uh, to live in? And one of the things we're trying to do is invest in keeping the city uh, affordable. Last year, we put in $187 million, which is resulting in us either constructing or renovating 47 uh, projects. Uh, I don't know what the stage is, but they're all underway. Is that right, right Nate? They're underway? Okay. Uh, and that will result ultimately uh, in us, by 2020, having 10,000 new units of housing, which is our plan. Um, we either have in the pipeline or have finished about 5,000 now. <laughs> in fact, on the current trajectory, we could actually have 12,000 units of housing uh, by 2020 if we continue on the path that we're on now. And the purpose of this is to be able to keep the price of housing down as low as we possibly can. Uh, about 40,000 people have left the District of Columbia in the last decade. And uh, we know that a number of those people have left because they couldn't afford to live here any longer. Um, so we're investing in making housing as affordable as we can. Uh, one of the things that we're doing that you'll see on the next sheet uh, is investing. You look at the second bullet, eight and a half million dollars in property tax relief. Well, what that, that's a program, that was a piece of legislation that was introduced uh, and championed by Council Member Anita Bonds. And uh, I was happy to be able to support that uh, in this budget. What it does, it says if you are um, 70 years of age, that your adjusted gross income every year is not more than $60,000, and you have owned a home for 20 years, and we're making a couple of tweaks in that to make it easier so it isn't 20 consecutive years. But if you meet all three of those criteria, you will never have to pay property taxes again uh, in the District of Columbia. That's another way of making housing affordable in the city because property taxes and increases in property taxes often are what makes some, a place unaffordable and people have to sell their home and either move out of the city or move into some place that they don't want to uh, move into. Um, the, uh, much of the $100 million that we're proposing to put in affordable housing will, go into the, will, will come from the Housing Production Trust uh, Fund. Uh, that's about $79 million. We are putting money into the local rent supplement program for vouchers for families and for um, uh, low-income seniors. And um, the, uh, Eric, you're up. I'm going to let you do this, but okay. All right. Eric loves to explain what the uh, Heat and Eat program is. And I know you all will be so enlightened by the time that he finishes explaining this. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. The, the LIHEAP program, the funding the mayor provided here, uh, $1.3 million, was in reaction to something the federal government did in the Farm Bill. Uh, they increased the uh, minimum uh, threshold of funding that we had to contribute from $1 to $20.01 uh, in terms of being able to get our maximum amount of federal funds. Uh, the mayor wanted to be certain that we were able to preserve our federal funding that we had coming in uh, for what's called our SNAP program, or the Supplemental uh, Nutrition Assistance Program, which used to be called food stamps here in the city. Uh, so to be able to uh, continue that amount, we had to put more money in uh, to energy assistance, which is actually a good thing because a lot of seniors here in the District of Columbia uh, will sometimes be displaced from their units or struggle, have tough situations uh, because of a heating bill in the winter or an air conditioning bill uh, during the summer. So this provides additional funding to help keep those low-income seniors uh, in their homes, at the same time allowing us to continue to maximize our full amount of federal funding here in the District of Columbia. So it's really a win-win uh, for the city. Thank you. Y'all got it. <laughs>
All right. Um, just as an example of affordable housing, this is really a great example. Um, this shows you a before and after shot. Y'all remember La Casa, which was a, uh, it was a shelter uh, for homeless folks right here in Ward 1? Yeah, Urban Street is right. That's on the left. And if you look on the right, this is what's newly been built. Uh, there's a brand new development that's been built uh, there, and it, this is affordable housing uh, for people who formerly uh, were homeless. I'm not sure how many units uh, we have there, but it's in Columbia Heights, and uh, it is really nice. We had the groundbreaking about a year and a half ago, and it is essentially finished uh, at this point, and will be another uh, effort on our part to help people who are homeless. We've made a commitment that by, the, uh, by, two, by 2015 that the city will have eliminated homelessness among veterans. Uh, our best estimate is we had somewhere around 550, 700 uh, veterans on the street who were homeless, and we've gotten about half of them uh, off the street now. So that number is somewhere between 250 and 300 that remain uh, on the streets. And the commitment is to get those folks off the streets so we can say, like Salt Lake City and Phoenix uh, can say now, the only two cities in America, that they don't have any veterans living on their streets uh, that are, that, that, who are uh, homeless. And this is a good example of the kind of thing that we can do. Um, and speaking of homelessness, we are, again, putting another $100 million this year uh, into affordable housing that will serve, in part, homeless families. Uh, we have a commitment to get 500 families uh, in 100 days. 100 days already started. It will end around the 15th of July, and the goal is to be able to get 500 families out of shelter, out of places like D.C. General or hotels or motels, and move them into permanent uh, apartments. I think we now have, I don't know if anybody has a number, uh, but we had, I think, I think we had placed 68 families uh, already as of about uh, a week ago. If anybody knows the current number, then uh, let me know. Uh, but uh, that means we've got, if that's right, we've got 432 uh, families to go. And I honestly think we can make that. We have uh, committed ourselves to a, um, a uh, goal uh, involving our congregations uh, in the District of Columbia in this. In addition to uh, us supporting it, we're putting through our rapid rehousing program, we are committed to paying the first four months of rent. If people are following their plan, uh, we will um, add another four months. And if, we, if they follow, they're still following their plan, uh, we can add another four months to that. I think the answer to how many is back there, right? How many? How many? 70? 70, 78? 78 of the 500? Okay, so. Okay, so we have 120 units that have been approved because uh, there were, uh, I think, a couple hundred that were offered up, right? Uh, and they had to go through an inspection process. So that 120 is in addition to the 78? Okay. Anyway, we've got 78 families placed, and I guess if you do some, you know, some back of the envelope math, that means we've got about 20 percent of the families done that we're trying to get done. Um, we are now about a month uh, into this effort, and we have until July 15th in order to get it done. We have asked our congregations, our mosques, our synagogues in the District of Columbia to take on uh, one family uh, each and provide support that we know they desperately need in order to not fall off the edge again. We just had a, uh, a group of folks to go out to Colorado. We found out that Colorado has a program uh, like this. They're the only state in the nation that has one, and we wanted to learn something from them in terms of how effectively to implement that uh, program here uh, in the District of Columbia. So we had a group that I think they went out over the weekend, and they'll be back tomorrow, uh, I think. Uh, and we will then move, move forward a pace uh, with involving the, um, the, the uh, religious community, faith community in this effort. Uh, we're putting a million dollars, proposing to put a million dollars in the HPAP program, which is a program for first-time home buyers uh, in Ward 7 and 8, where we don't have a lot of homeowners relative to the rest of the city. We're putting a, uh, proposing to put $300,000 in a home ownership campaign 
and then $250,000 uh, in an emergency uh, housing program in the office of the uh, tenant uh, advocate. Um, before we go further, I see that our chairman uh, of the council uh, has come in. I want to welcome him, uh, Chairman Phil Mendelson. And you know what, Chairman? Uh, I, before I go on to the third pillar, would you like to come up and say a couple of words? Uh, I appreciate you coming out. <laughs> I've, I've been badgering him and badgering him to please come out, and, uh, and, and Phil is a good guy, and I'm glad that you came out tonight, sir. Been to every meeting. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I really don't have much to say. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, this is an important part of the uh, budget process. As I think you know, the council got the budget April 3rd. The committees are wrapping up their hearings next week. They're going to mark up. Uh, every committee is going to make recommendations to the Committee of the Whole with regard to what the budget should look like. So if you want to take what you're learning tonight and uh, translate that to comments to the Council, you should do that in the next week. Uh, the, the committees, as I said, are marking up next week. The following week, uh, we will informally meet to uh, discuss how to reconcile any differences and what our priorities are as a council. And then we're scheduled to vote first reading on May 28th. Um, that'll, that'll, <laughs> I'm glad you appreciated that. Um, and this is an inside joke. I, I apologize for my colleagues. Um, we're scheduled to vote May 28th, and uh, so. Uh, any input you have, please get it to us by then. And thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Mayor. The third of those four pillars is encouraging economic and workforce uh, development. Um, we are proposing to put $4.2 million to continue to uh, you know, train adults to be able to get to work. We have, unfortunately, a lot of people in this city whose literacy levels are relatively low. And then, as I've indicated, we're putting another $2.5 million into workforce development uh, at uh, the community college, which is proving to be an important part of our uh, workforce development system. For the first time in the history of this city, we have a full workforce development system. The community college, the Department of Employment Services, um, the career and technical education uh, academies that I talked about. Um, the Workforce Investment Council and the Workforce Intermediaries, all of which are focusing on getting especially adults uh, to work or people who are about to be adults. Um, the next thing you see is the One City Business Portal. And you're what the heck is that? Um, this, is <laughs> this is a great idea, uh, and I'm proud to be associated with it. We had a um, a uh, business and regulatory reform task force that was co-chaired by um, Nick Majette. Uh, Nick has now gone on to be the county administrator, uh, which is like the city administrator of Prince George's County. It's a great, great appointment, and uh, I can't think of a better choice than Nick Majette to do that. And uh, David Goldblatt. <clears throat> and basically what this says is that uh, for those who have to apply, apply to a number of agencies through this approach, you can apply to eight agencies through one avenue. Uh, it'll access, right, Robbie, it'll access uh, the websites of those up to eight agencies so you can kind of apply uh, all in one step. It, this is a major uh, step uh, forward. Um, we're proposing to continue to invest in uh, the St. Elizabeth campus. We just had a meeting last week where we announced the RFP uh, for phase one. Uh, people have to indicate to us, I guess in the next few weeks, if they're going to apply and uh, then submit their proposals uh, sometime in June, I think it is. Uh, Macmillan, uh, we're continue to, continuing to invest in the development of the Macmillan site. Uh, shops at Dakota Crossing. How many of y'all been to Costco? Almost everybody. Uh, Costco, the, the Costco that we have is the first time we've ever had retail in Fort Lincoln. Um, and they've been open now for about a year and a half. Uh, the first year, they grossed about $150 million. Uh, and one of the reasons, I'm sure, is because they sell liquor over there. Uh, <laughs> well, they do. <laughs> and I'm not going to ask you if you bought any booze over there, okay? You bought whatever you want to booze. No, no, nothing wrong with that. And they sell gasoline uh, over there uh, as well. 
I would just caution you not to gas up your car and then go buy a drink. Uh, that, that's, that's dangerous stuff. Um, in any event, uh, we are, uh, we've had the groundbreaking now for Skyland Town Center, which is the longest undone project in the history of the District of Columbia. It is now underway. Uh, Walter Reed, and we've had the groundbreaking for the Southwest Waterfront, and the first phase of that will be finished by um, the middle of 2017, and then there'll be another phase after that. That's going to generate lots of new opportunities and lots of uh, dollars uh, for, the, uh, for the city. Um, the fourth pillar is improving the quality of life for everybody. And of course, one of the, the groups we're gonna focus on, uh, right, Dr. Thompson, is our seniors. Uh, we're proposing to put another $2 million into our uh, wellness centers. That will, I think, allow us to extend the hours um, each day and for the first time have weekend hours uh, in our wellness centers. So they will be open six days uh, a week, uh, which will be a good thing. Um, to uh, put almost a half a million dollars into our commu commu commodity supplemental food program and add another $3 million to our transportation services uh, for um, seniors. Uh, this will give them a lot more flexibility to get out and about and around uh, the city. Um, it also will create some capacity for us to uh, not have to, re to turn to uh, Metro Access every time somebody need has a medical appointment. Uh, we're gonna use taxi cabs. How many of y'all like the colors of our taxi cabs now? I don't know if you couldn't care less. <laughs> actually, <laughs> actually, to be honest with you, it's, it's really developing a uniform appearance around the city now. Um, we probably have, what do you think, Alan, 1,500, 2,000 taxi cabs that have gotten their uh, cabs painted uh, under our new scheme. Uh, we've been giving people, if they get it done by the end of June, they get a $200 uh, rebate. Uh, for getting it done because we want to hurry up the process so we have a uniform look across the uh, city. But if a taxi cab takes a person to a medical appointment, I think that'll be 30 some dollars and Metro Access is $50, so it'll save some money there. We're proposing to build a new hospital. Uh, most of you are familiar with what used to be called K. Fritz Memorial Hospital, which then became Greater Southeast Hospital, which today is the United Medical Center. Um, it is an antiquated uh, facility. And uh, we know that there needs to be a hospital, a full health care system on the east end uh, of the District of Columbia. And this would allow us to build a new hospital, which we're proposing $300 million uh, for. Um, that will, um, uh, that will, would be built on the grounds of St. Elizabeth's uh, Hospital. Uh, we would not be in the, uh, in the business of operating a hospital because it's not something that the city does well. But we know that there is interest out there on the part of health care uh, providers in being able to operate the hospital. And we're going to be having those discussions over the next couple of weeks, uh, given the fact that we have at least one proposal uh, already to do that. We have a relatively new hospital. When was the new hospital, uh, the psychiatric facility built, Steve? 2010, opened in 2010. So this would be on the grounds of St. Elizabeth's and would create a comprehensive uh, healthcare experience, uh, including the psychiatric uh, services, as well as the acute care uh, services in the new hospital. Um, we will cover for the first time, right, Wayne, uh, transplants uh, under the Medicaid program, two and a half million dollars for that and then services that would benefit uh, children and help us to continue to hopefully reduce the uh, infant mortality rate uh, here uh, in the city. We also are proposing to do something that really this is almost unprecedented, and that is to, to start to increase the grants that are available to people who are receiving TANF, or as some people call it welfare, receiving welfare benefits. Um, I don't think that the, the grant hasn't been increased since 1996, is that right? So this would increase the grant now. Um, it would increase the uh, grant again in 2016 by the uh, Consumer Price Index. And then in 17, it would increase it by 46%, which would make it equal to what it would have been if people had gotten an inflationary increase starting in, uh, in, in 1996, which since it, when it was the last time it was increased. And it'll be roughly equivalent uh, to Maryland. And then in 2018, 
there would be a CPI uh, increase uh, as well. In terms of public safety and justice, um, we uh, are proposing to continue 4,000 uh, officers in our Metropolitan Police Department. I don't know if you, any of you got that mailing uh, a few weeks ago that said that uh, I was responsible and I guess Mendelssohn was responsible for reducing the, um, the police force by 400 police officers in the District of Columbia. Um, let me be as kind as I can, it was a lie. We haven't reduced any police officers in the District of Columbia. Chairman, did you reduce any, did you reduce any police officers in the District of Columbia? I didn't either, so it was a lie. Uh, but people don't have, they're not, they're not required to tell the truth uh, when they send out some of this information. And um, that was a dastardly thing uh, to do. And so, in case you didn't understand what I said, it was a lie. And if I was outside, I'd probably describe it more graphically um, than that, because I can do that too. Um, we're proposing to put additional money into our uh, access to justice system to help people with legal assistance. Almost $200,000 in a mobile library uh, service for uh, folks who are in jail. Uh, $1.4 million to support our Department of Forensic uh, Sciences. Uh, $91 million to continue to upgrade the equipment and the fire stations in the District of Columbia and so on and so forth. Uh, we will meet our full WMATA subsidy of $292 million, and uh, we will invest $810 million over the, the six-year period in for continuing to build out the uh, streetcar system. The first streetcar system will be open right now this year for service, for what do you call it, revenue service? I mean, collected money, right? Yeah, people will pay to get on. Uh, that will be on 8th Street uh, Northeast and will run from the uh, Hopscotch Bridge out to uh, Oklahoma Avenue, which will be the beginning of a 37-mile system uh, here in the District of Columbia. Uh, we are going to build a circulator bus garage. That's $41 million and uh, purchase a bunch of uh, circulator buses for $49 uh, million. We're proposing to uh, upgrade sidewalks more bike lanes, more trails, and we are proposing over a period of time, I don't know what the, the timetable is, to put in 30,000 LED lights. Uh, do you know what the timetable is or not? Ten thousand and eighteen months? Yeah, of course if somebody's light goes out on their street, they'll, they'll be replaced right away, right? Yeah. Um, in any event, LED lights will be uh, much less uh, energy sapping and uh, the lighting will actually be better as a result uh, of that. That's going to cost uh, $55 million to maintain our streets and install the new lights. Um, we are proposing, this, this, is, this, is, this actually is groundbreaking, I mean this is stuff that I care a lot about, I'm sure our agency directors too, and that is a new procurement system for the District of Columbia. We've been working on that for um, a year. And I know if James Staten were here tonight, he would come up here and preach to you, quite literally, about what this is going to do uh, for uh, the city. It means that agencies will be in a position then to have better control over their procurements because staff that are currently working for the Office of Contract and Procurement uh, will be then based in the agencies. Um, one of the travesties is, I'm going to use, uh, uh, where, where did Wayne go? Uh, the Department of Healthcare Finance um, with a $3 billion budget has no procurement staff. It has to rely completely on the Office of Contract and Procurement to get their procurements done. And um, that's just not a good thing. It just takes too long. And so we've been working, <clears throat> we've been working uh, internally, we've been working with the chairman uh, to be able to introduce a new approach uh, to procurement and we are now in the course of rolling it out. Uh, Staten has been meeting with the agency directors and I think, I don't know, by the middle or end of June, um, the uh, staff will be on board and placed in the agencies to create a brand new procurement system uh, here in the city. Those agencies that already have procurement authority, like the Department of Behavioral Health, 
or the Child and Family Services Agency, they will not be affected. They will continue to have what they have now. We're not going to take anything from anybody. We're going to try to increase the capacity of those uh, that don't have procurement authority. Um, we are proposing to, uh, again, a $15 million city fund uh, for um, money that's available, managed by the uh, Community Foundation, that would be available to uh, nonprofits. Uh, we had, I don't know, we had 315 applications, grant applications, uh, this, this first round, and there were, I think, 58 or 60 or something like that that were funded. And uh, that tells you the level of need uh, that exists. But the hope is that the council will continue to support this approach. Uh, it's not anything that the government, the government is not involved at all in the decision making. We simply wanted to make the dollars available. We established the priorities and then the applications are all reviewed and graded and uh, decided upon by the community foundation which exists to do specifically that. I think they have, I don't know, they have over 300 different funds that they manage now. So they're managing our fund uh, for the same um, purpose. Putting a million and a half dollars into DPR programs. Um, the next slide, should I skip over this one, Chairman, about legislative and budget autonomy? <laughs> anyway, we're very hopeful that we will have both of those in the, in the foreseeable future, and we'll find out on one of them fairly soon. Uh, we're proposing to hire a, a statehood uh, commission director, and we're proposing to put $100,000 of non-personal services funding into the uh, statehood uh, delegation. And then we're proposing a number of uh, <clears throat> tax, uh, tax changes uh, in the city, the most significant of which I will focus on, and that is creating a new tax bracket for people who make forty to $60,000 uh, a year. Uh, it would reduce the taxes from 8.5% down to 7.5%, which would be a fairly significant increase, uh, in decrease for those who are in that um, income level. I won't spend any time talking about the rest. The last thing is that um, despite the fact that our city is doing well and we've been raising more and more money, uh, we still have a, a set of needs that um, we can't meet. And so we said if more money comes in, if we find out from the CFO that more money will be generated and we'll find out in June if we got more money or in September if we got more money or in December if we got more money, then why don't we set up a priority list now of things that we would fund based on what comes in the door. And there's 20 things on this list. Uh, more money going into infant and toddler programs, which nobody can argue, I, I, wouldn't, I would argue with anybody that this is a great investment. Um, additional tax relief, <clears throat> uh, more money going into the University of the District of Columbia and to fund adult uh, literacy uh, programs. Um, over on the next slide, uh, I don't know, you can pick out uh, more funding for uh, summer youth uh, activities, investing in the mayor's scholarship program. Uh, and then the final slide is uh, the uh, changes in the standard deduction, which is number 15. Uh, you probably saw in the previous one an increase in the uh, personal exemption, both of which would be tax benefits for people who are not <clears throat> itemizers, who don't itemize on their taxes. Um, and then um, more money for the arts, and uh, so on and so forth. I won't, uh, unless you all have a question about it, I won't spend any time on those. So that is the fiscal year, proposed fiscal year 2015 uh, budget. Um, again, uh, if you want to, the chairman is still here, you can just say to him before you go, just pass the budget that's been proposed by the mayor. Uh, you don't need to spend all that time, you know, bringing people together and having discussions and whatnot. That is the best budget that you've ever seen in your life, and uh, you think it should be, well, it doesn't work that way, does it? Uh, we wish it were, but probably since the beginning of time, right, Frank? People have, the council has uh, made, had its priorities, its interests, and has um, changed the budget uh, in some ways. And, we look forward to working with the council on uh, those uh, discussions uh, as, we will, as we will do. So um, we'll open it up for any questions or comments uh, that you may have. Hi, good evening. How are you doing? 
I'm Sylvia Robinson from the Georgia Avenue Community Development Task Force. How are you? Uh, and my question is about Park Morton. Uh, yeah. And we saw in the budget that there was a, a general category for the new communities projects, but there was no indication of the pr priority or the amount allocated to Park Morton. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the priority of Park Morton development in new communities? Yeah, I, I don't know if, uh, you want to talk about it, Jeff? Come on up. Good evening, my name is Jeff Miller. I'm with the Deputy Mayor's Office. Um, the new communities uh, uh, budget for, I believe, 2015 is $37 million. Mm -hmm. There's not a, it's, it's not specifically allocated to any of, this, of the individual communities. Uh, those will be negotiated with the individual developers when we do the RFP for them. So there is money allocated in the new communities. We assume some of it will go to Park Morton, but there's no discrete amount uh, set right now. We have, uh, we've actually been trying, why don't you come back up, Jeff? We've been trying to, uh, this is a very difficult initiative to make work, is that right? Absolutely. Uh, and not just because it's Park Morton, because there's four of them. There's Lincoln Heights and Richardson, there's uh, Barry Farm, there's Northwest One, and there's Park Morton. Uh, can you talk a little bit about why it's so difficult to make this work? Well, first of all, they're very resource dependent because we are looking for 100% replacement housing for the existing housing at um, very affordable levels of, uh, of affordability. And then we're also trying to create mixed-use communities so that we have affordability at the 60% of AMI and 80% of AMI, which also creates uh, some uh, dedication of resources, generally city resources, for that, for that effort. Okay. Let's go to this mic over here. Hi, Mr. Mayor and Wilcox. I wanted to say, I want to go on record saying I remember the Armstrong School auto body program. Yep. <laughs> and I think that building is still um, a historic building, hopefully. So. Uh, yeah, it's actually being used as a charter school. That's uh, right. That's now. right. Okay. And yeah, it's right nice. across from the uh, brand new Dunbar High School. Right, right. Where I went to school. Not the brand new one, but I right. went to Dunbar. <laughs> thank you. My question was, I wanted to thank you for putting the D.C. jail library in your mm -hmm. budget. Mm -hmm. but, and there's a lot of good news here, but I, I didn't hear returning citizens at all. I just wondered if there's any emphasis or special programs for returning citizens' reengagement. There, there actually is. Uh, and we, you know, in order to make this a manageable presentation, we, of course, couldn't put everything in there. But... Um, we have a new resource center on Martin Luther King Avenue that we just finished within the last year. Uh, I don't know if Charles Thornton, is Charles Thornton in here? Well, he can tell him he got called out. Uh, the, uh, there's a new, new resource center on Martin Luther King Avenue. There is a, an increasing emphasis on um, returning citizens. We're trying to get some of our returning citizens into some of the uh, programs at the community college, as well as the money that we're putting into uh, DOES for adult job training uh, as well. Um, one of the things I would like to do, and it's not in this budget because we're just not there yet, and that is to be able to include a, a community college component um, into our, uh, our incarceration services, for want of a better way of putting it, so people can get those kinds of services um, before they come back. Yes. Good evening. My name is Patrick Nelson. I'm also a member of the Georgia Asian Task Force. And my question relates to, with the D.C. USA TIF being paid off early, we'd like for those funds to be used to benefit Columbia Heights, Pleasant Plains, and Parkview. We believe the best vehicle for doing this is to reestablish the neighborhood investment fund targeted to Columbia Heights. What are your thoughts on this? Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Jeff? From the uh, Department of, uh, from, from DEMPED. Yeah, we're very pleased we were able to pay that off. Um, you, that, uh, those funds were put into this community when uh, it was a, a, a less well-served community, and um, we are looking to find other ways to reallocate those monies. Um, some of it will stay here, and some of it will go to other communities in, in the city that, that need uh, revitalization like this community did several years back. Let me add one more piece to that. I'm going to be honest with you. Um, I think the Neighborhood Investment Fund actually involved earmarks uh, because they went specifically to certain organizations. I, I am not a supporter of earmarks at all. I am a supporter of making dollars available 
to our nonprofit um, community, uh, but on a competitive basis. That's why we set up the One City Fund. Because all I, I've seen earmarks abused. I was in the council when there was some incredible abuse um, that was um, observed uh, with earmarks on the table. And what they tend to do is make some people happy and, and, and make a lot of people very unhappy. Uh, so I, I can tell you just from my perspective, I'm definitely not a supporter of uh, earmarks. And to the extent that NIF would bring back earmarks, I would not be a supporter of that. But I am a supporter of making these dollars available on a competitive basis to organizations that have that need. Yes. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Natalia Stracuzzi, uh, Ward 8 resident. I'm happy to say Union Methodist, I mean, um, Union Medical Care Center is still going to stay in Ward 8. United Medical Center. United Medical Center. But what I'd like to know is, are we selling that property to come up with the $3 million? No. And no, it's not $3 million, it's $300 million. Uh, $300 million then. Are we, so we're not selling the property, and we're going to put that money out and let another hospital take it and profit from it. And then on top of that, with the, uh, the circulator and the, wait a minute, and, and the cars. Wait, wait a minute. Wait, 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 wait. Somebody's going to profit from it? What does that mean? Well, you said another uh, company would come in and run it. I, I said, yeah, they, they would be operating. Nobody's making a profit off of hospitals these days, I can assure you. And the government, the government is really ill-equipped to run them. The only reason we would be asking somebody to come in and do this is because we think it would be a better provided service. So I just don't want to leave that out there, that we're inviting somebody in to come in and make money off the government's uh, back. That's just not true. Um, there, there is no hospital. Uh, other than the United Medical Center, which is on Southern Avenue. Um, it is an antiquated facility. It was built for 450 people. We would not build a facility like that again. So the idea is to put the best state-of-the-art facility that we possibly can uh, in place uh, on the east end of the District of Columbia and get the best provider that we can in order to be able to run that service. You know, uh, United Medical Center was about gone. And we've been investing money in it to save it uh, up to this point. So I don't want to leave any impression that there's some, you know, major profit being made off of the United Medical Center or will be uh, at this stage. The idea is to create a first-class uh, comprehensive medical si uh, system uh, on the east end of the city. And what percentages would it, uh, residents gain from that revenue that was put out there? What do you mean, what percentage? Like, uh, shouldn't there be some type of a percentage of what the district gets and what the, the people running it are going to get? The, the money will all be put back into the running of the hospital. Uh, and what would and, that and private entity get? Well, I don't know. We, we don't, we don't no, know, well, that's you know who the private entity is at this stage. But if, if your question is whether we're going to open a new medical facility that will line somebody's pockets, the answer is no. All right. And the circular, is that private or district run? And district, the Charlie cars? District, district run. All right. Yep. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. How are you doing? My name is Joycelyn Thompson, part of the Georgia Avenue Task Force, mm -hmm. and my question has to do with Bruce Monroe Park. As a community, we have been struggling with upgrades for the park. Now that DPR has taken over part of the ownership, can we, we would like to see funds included in DPR's budget. Can this be done? Uh, what was the park again? Bruce Monroe. Oh, Bruce Monroe. Uh, I'll ask Dr. Uh, Shanklin if she can uh, speak to the uh, operation and management of uh, Bruce Monroe. You mean where the school used to be, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good evening, everyone. We're actually waiting for a transfer of jurisdiction before we can execute the improvements that the community has been waiting for, and we expect that to happen very shortly. Well, but, well, well let's, let's assume that jurisdiction has been transferred. What would happen then in terms of the question uh, that she asked? I, I'm, I'm a, okay, Brian. We have um, a $200,000 that's allotted for some uh, improvements to the park that will include uh, benches and um, a few other amenities on site, two water fountains and a small pavilion. And uh, once the transfer is effective, which should be shortly, uh, that work will get underway uh, uh, quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Ruby? Good evening, Mr. Mayor. How you doing? I was going to stay home, but I got a ticket for $45, so I noticed they increased the fee. <laughs> so I oh, figured, let me come uh, and speak up. I'm sorry you got a ticket. <laughs> I know. I haven't gotten one in a long time. <laughs> but I wanted to say thank you because under your administration, a lot of things changed for the community that I serve, which is the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgender community. Um, 
So every time I get a chance, I, I'd like to thank you because not many thank leaders you. have done that in the past. I do know that there has been resources allocated for LGBT youth homelessness. And I do work a lot on crisis intervention. So many of the clients that I have face barriers obtaining employment. A lot of them go through the cycle of incarceration because when they do come out, there's not a lot of um, services available to them. Uh, because the ones that are available haven't caught up yet with sensitivity towards, against homophobia and transphobia. So I know you don't believe in earmark money, but I do believe because many of my clients cannot go to the traditional places. Um, have you earmarked or put money into the Office of LGBT Affairs? Um, usually when I reach out to them, I know before they didn't have grant making authority. Um, you know, the LGBT population is 10% in the city, and I believe that their taxes should also go to, you know, the needs for their own community. So, well, I, I certainly agree with that. Uh, but the op the uh, Office of LGBT Affairs is not the only place where we spend money on the uh, issues affecting uh, people who are gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, or um, questioning. Yeah. Um, Sterling, I see you in the queue right there. You want to speak to this, but I, I would ask you in speaking to it that you speak to some of the other agencies like the Department of Human Services, the Department of Health, because I know you collaborate with a lot of yes, the agencies yes. as well. Very often I see the grant alerts, and yeah. very often none of the grants that come out make reference to uh, LGBT populations. There are very few. Like I started seeing some after you came into office. One of them was the Office of Victim Services, which I thought it was outstanding because we do have a large problem with uh, hate crimes and domestic violence in the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. But most of the other grants make no reference of the LGBT populations. I, I would assume, and I, and I think it's a safe assumption, that the absence of mention would mean that they're included, not excluded. Uh, you want to add to that, Sterling? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, and as you said, we work across multiple agencies. We work with, for example, the Office of Latino Affairs, which has funded Casa Ruby, as well as DCHR, and really just across DC government, uh, the Department of Corrections, and many, many others. So there is, uh, we certainly have all the resources that we need uh, through our, through the Executive Office of the Mayor and through interaction with those other agencies. Well, and I'm going to say something that may not sound good, but yeah, a recent let, let, study let, let showed that... I don't, I don't want to get involved, get people involved in a debate in here. Yeah. Today, but you go ahead and make your comment. Yeah, I just wanted to say that the latest study that was done by the Williams Institute, American University and George Washington University, showed that there's homelessness for trans populations up to 40%. Unemployment in the transgender population is 50%. And out of the 50% that are higher, they make less than 50 $15,000 a year. 60% of the respondents of the survey are HIV positive, and many of them are homeless. So really, services are not reaching out to us. And there may be the, um, the desire, but in reality is these studies are done by credible institutions. And I just wanted to make the point that mm -hmm. it may not sound like the needs are, you know, important, but to me they are. No, I, I, I think you know I believe they're important. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why we, um, uh, you know, got uh, the Department of Employment Services involved in developing programs uh, through, uh, through, through some of their, uh, through the aegis of DOES. Um, we put money into a, uh, an outreach campaign to better educate people on what it means to be uh, someone who's transgender. Um, we just put money, right, uh, Wayne, into the, uh, where's Wayne? Oh, I thought he was still in here. Anyway, into uh, a, a gender dysphoria program, right? It's the first time I think Medicaid has uh, supported uh, a gender dysphoria program, certainly in the city. I don't know about nationally. Um, but there is, you know, do, do we need to do more? Yep, there's no question about it. But I think we've done a whole lot more than was in place uh, two, two or three years ago. Uh, 
from the Medicaid perspective, the gender dysphoria program is being managed in your office, right? And then we've got, um, you know, we've got uh, insurance companies now that are being required to offer uh, that coverage, commercial insurance companies being offered, required to offer that coverage. I don't know if you want to comment on any of that or not. No, I, it's not much to add. If the uh, Medicaid's policy is crystal clear, if the uh, procedures are deemed to be medically necessary, Medicaid will pay for it. Okay. Yep. Good evening. How you doing? My name is Darren Jones. I'm also with the Georgia Avenue Task Force. My question is, in expanding the circulator bus, in, extent, in expanding the budget for the circulator bus, can new routes be expanded specifically, one which brings the circulator bus up Georgia Avenue? Uh, let me ask uh, Matt if you can speak to that. Um, but I'll tell you something. I, I hear questions about circulator a lot. And one of the questions that needs to be asked is, what kind of bus system are we going to have in this city? Uh, are we going to have a local bus system that's operated by the District of Columbia? Or are we going to have Metro operating uh, the bus system? That's the basic question I think needs to be asked, because we could, you know, we could keep expanding. For example, let's say Georgia Avenue. You have a Metro bus system on Georgia Avenue, too. At some stage, you've got to bring those two issues together, because I don't think you can run a circulator and a Metro uh, bus uh, on Georgia Avenue. And I think we're probably running circulator now in some places where we have Metro bus. Matt, can you speak to some of that? I can, yes, sir. Um, and you're right. I mean, that's the discussion we need to have about, about what bus service we provide in the district. What's, set up, what's, what's funded in the budget next year is, um, is four extensions, the mall route, uh, reestablishment of a mall route, uh, extension of the Roslyn Georgetown, uh, I believe up New Hampshire and, and over U is the, is the route that we're looking at right now. Um, Union Station to National Cathedral, Mr. Mayor, that's an area where there are a lot of metro buses, and so we're looking at coordinating that. And then also um, along the southwest waterfront, the mayor has included uh, $14 million in the budget over the next six years for, for uh, circulator expansions, and we're looking at any number of options. We know that Georgia Avenue is a congested quarter. There are a lot of metro buses, and we're looking long term about how to move people on Georgia Avenue. And we got, what, $49 million for new circulator buses, right? Mm -hmm. And $41 million for a new garage? Right, right. So, it, and that's a replacement of some of the existing bus, buses over the next six years and also the expansion buses. Okay. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mr. Mayor. How are you uh, doing? Kent Bass from ANC 1A. Um, I would like to revisit the topic of the historic Parkview School Building, and I would like to frame it this way. Um, it was originally scheduled for modernization in three phases, started uh, with the phases being in 2012, 2016, and 2018. Uh, the 2012 phase one was um, extremely robust, and there are a lot of improvements, and I'm grateful for that. Um, yet when I looked at the budget last year, I saw that the 2016 modernization evaporated, and the only one that was there was 2018. In digging into it, I understand that that's because the 2012 modernization was so robust that part of that phase two had been re uh, rolled into it. Again, I appreciate that. You mean it had been advanced? It, it had been advanced, and yeah. again, I appreciate mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. um, but in looking at the budget this year, I was surprised to see that the 2018 phase has completely evaporated. And I, again, I appreciate the theme of keeping promises, but there are a lot of promises that have been unkept with this school community, many of which date prior to your administration. Um, if you think back to the way Parkview and Bruce Monroe were consolidated and the jockeying for which building would be used, um, there's still, it's still a very tender issue. Now, I am grateful that we're going to get the elevator and the lifts to comply with the ADA uh, issues this summer. Again, greatly appreciated and desperately needed. Uh, and it sounds like some other high priority issues may have some flexibility. But it, it gets down to the point of if any school modernization, once it's been committed to and underway, improves to the point where the phase two or three can then just be removed, <coughs> what's the point of a phase? Mm -hmm. um, again, there was a commitment to the community and I'd kind of like to know where that third phase went. Um, Brian, can you, can you speak to that? I, I, I do know this, in constructing the budget, um, as much as we would like to not change anything, 
there are exigencies that result in changes. In fact, that's probably how, on the opposite end of your question, that's probably how Parkview got moved up uh, for spending money in 12 that might not have been spent then until 16 uh, or 18. Um, the day will come, fortunately, you know, when we will have gotten around to every school, the city will have gotten around the first time to every school, and uh, some of these kinds of issues will disappear. Um, on the other hand, I, I appreciate the advocacy, especially Commissioner Bates. I know you've been a great advocate for not only that, but a lot of other things. Um, and it helps us be able to continue to focus on the uh, priorities that are most important to people, recognizing, sadly, that the priorities uh, typically outweigh the dollars that we have. In fact, that's what we saw with the, uh, the priority list of services in the operating budget that we couldn't fund uh, this year because the money just wasn't uh, available. So, Brian, you want to? Yeah, I mean, there's not a whole lot more to elaborate on. Um, the, the, the next phase is actually scheduled in 2021, which is just outside of this year's CIP. And I, I should note that in, um, in the summer of uh, FY12, um, the amount of money that went into the phase projects um, close to doubled. So we actually accelerated work on a number of schools, including, including Bruce Monroe. And um, we are, of course, doing the elevator project this summer. And I, you know, I get this question a lot. We've got two-thirds of our schools that have been uh, modernized, either wholly or in part, and about a third, therefore, that are left to be touched. And I know that we probably can't get there fast enough for a lot of the parents and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and advocates out there, but we are moving as quickly as we can within the constraints of time and money and, and all that other stuff. Mm -hmm. So we're, we, we understand and we're getting there as fast as we can. Commissioner Bates, if there's some issues that you think we should be focusing on as a part of what we're trying to do this summer, um, I would welcome you submitting those to me and to, uh, to Director Hanlon and we'll see, you know, we'll see what we can do. Sure. Would that, could you do that? Okay, thank you. Yep, you're going to get the last question on this side, okay? Thank you. Greetings to our mayor and to Dr. Smith and all who are gathered here today. Thank you so much again for this opportunity. Um, I am PJ Green Young, a Howard Manor resident, uh, Award One resident, and also um, a proud member of the Georgia Avenue Community Development Task Force. So, in that light, you got um, a lot going on. <laughs> just a few things, <laughs> um, given the energy. Um, the Howard Town Center has been awarded. Uh, an $800,000 tax abatement, um, and the money had been allocated to fund this. Now, although the Georgia, I'm sorry, although the Howard Town Center project had been delayed, we'd really like to see these funds stay on Georgia Avenue, Georgia Avenue, um, to fund additional storefront improvements, a BID, or additional affordable housing. So going forward with the marvelous plan that you laid out this evening, um, how can we make this happen? Uh, in terms of keeping the money uh, in Georgia Avenue? Uh, the town center project, I, I, I'm not sure where that is. I don't think it's moving forward at this stage because, you know, Jeff? Good, go right ahead. You're, you're correct. The Howard Town Center project has been delayed. Uh, I understand it's, there is some litigation associated with it, so it's not clear what's happening with that project. I will tell you that at 965 Sherman Avenue, uh, right at Florida and Sherman, uh, our project uh, with MRP and JBG is moving forward, uh, and that will, uh, is expected to bring a grocery store to that neighborhood. Um, so we're very excited about that. Also, Georgia Avenue uh, is considered a great street, and I, I use my fingers to quote Great Street. It's a program we have here in, in the city to uh, provide improved improvements, capital improvements to private business owners, uh, grants up to $85,000 per business to do capital improvements, facade improvements, and things of that nature. And um, th we have put out a Great Streets grant application. We did that about, I want to say, about 60 days ago. There's been consideration of, of the applications that came in. I, I don't know how many we have and how many grants we're giving out. I think that we have about $1.3 or $1.5 million worth of grants to give out in this particular round. And I'm absolutely certain many of those are going to Georgia Avenue. So is that going to stay on Georgia Avenue, the $800,000 that was allocated? Will it stay? I, I don't, I, was it actually $800,000 in money or was it a tax abatement? But a tax abatement is not cash. That's just simply money that somebody doesn't have to pay. No, I, I, don't, I, don't know, uh, I don't know that Councilmember Evans, I, I don't, do you know anything about Councilmember Evans advocating for some money to... The tax abatement is not cash, though. 
that's, that's like me saying, um, well, it's like what we're saying with our property taxes for seniors. Uh, it's worth a lot to the seniors, but it means money you just won't have to pay. But there's no liquidity to it in terms of moving it somewhere else. I don't know what Councilmember Evans may have had in mind. He'd have to explain that himself. But um, I can assure you this, that a tax abatement is not cash money that we can move to another place. Thank you so much. I don't know if that satisfies you, but that's the best answer we can give. Uh, Okay. All right. All right, ladies, you all going to get the last two uh, comments or oh, questions. Thank you, thank you Mr. Mayor. Uh, my name is Gabriela Mosi. I'm ANC Commissioner in Adams Morgan. I'm also with the D.C. Latino Caucus. So I'd like to make two comments. And one is, uh, on behalf of the Latino community, we're very grateful for some of, of the initiatives that your administration has taken on behalf of, of our community, especially this week that we were able now, our, you know, our members, uh, our Latino residents are able to get driver's licenses. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're very grateful for that. Starting um, May 1st. Yes. Uh, undocumented. Which is undocumented exactly. Undocumented folks, yeah. yes. mm -hmm. So, but moving on to, to the budget, I do see a lot of very good investments in our city. I have one small comment. Uh, I only see $700,000 for small business technical assistance, and I work in many commercial corridors around the city, uh, so I, I do want to comment on that. I was surprised that that is, seems to be a small amount when our small businesses do contribute greatly to the city, and they pay many taxes, and they employ many of our residents. I know that this technical assistance is, is critical sometimes. It's great. <clears throat> that we're doing facades, that we're doing the Great Streets program and many other things. But sometimes we do need to also improve what happens inside of those businesses and also to help those who want to open a business and make sure that they open it right. Mm -hmm. So that is the one thing. It seemed to me that $700,000 for the entire city was a bit low. Yeah, and I don't know how that compares. Uh, I don't know, Eric, if you can address that. Um, but one of the things that we've tried to do is to really beef up our um, LSDBE uh, program so that more opportunities are being made available to our small businesses above and beyond whatever technical assistance may be provided because, you know, we've been concerned in the past about the fact that not enough small businesses were getting enough contract opportunities uh, in the city. So we're really trying to improve uh, that. Eric, you want to address the, the technical assistance aspect? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the technical assistance obviously is a very important program. I don't want it, though, be left that that's the only program that we have for small businesses here in the budget. Uh, we actually have a department that's devoted to small businesses and a lot of different programs and investments within uh, our DSLBD uh, agency. A couple other things the mayor's got in the budget. One is to help new businesses come on board. He talked about the One City Business Portal, which will actually make it easier for someone who wants to start a small business to get through the process. A lot of people do want to start small businesses. They're really the backbone of the city, uh, so that'll make it easier for that. Also, the mayor has reduced taxes uh, on our small businesses through the uh, franchise tax reduction, which will really uh, benefit the brick-and-mortar stores uh, here in the District of Columbia, particularly our small businesses, and that'll be money that they can you know, invest right back in businesses. So we, we've got a lot of exciting programs we could talk to you about after this. Uh, within DSLBD, and I'm sure the the agency would probably be happy to discuss more of those as well. I want to I want to thank you for mentioning the uh, driver's license uh, issue too. That was a piece of legislation that I was delighted to be a part of. Uh, I don't know why the council took so long just to simply wind up right back at the same place where we were uh, in the first place. Um, it wasn't the chairman that did it. I'm not going to make sure that I'm going to leave that at the chairman's doorstep because uh, he doesn't handle every piece of legislation that goes through the council. Um, but um, we, we uh, have a mailing going out, too. Is that right, Lucinda? Uh, that will further explain not only what we're doing with the uh, driver's licenses for people who are undocumented, but also the real ID um, uh, requirement that we're, we have to conform to. Is that right? Right. The mail is on the The mailer is only going to address real ID because needless to say, we do not have addresses for anyone who may be undocumented in our database. They're not in our database. Okay. 
but that doesn't mean that the information couldn't get to everybody. What, what are the various modalities that we're using to get the uh, information out? We've been communicating with the um, Latino community. I'm actually participating in a forum this Saturday at um, Carlos Rosario Adult Education Center. So people have been inviting us out to communicate and, get, and help get the word out. Okay. Lillian, you're going to have the last word. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I want to say that our forum is at 10 a.m., so please encourage anybody that needs to be added to come to it. Mr. Mayor, first I want to um, uh, say thank you for all the good work that you've done. Uh, I praise you for the early childhood program because my grandchild is at um, one, uh, award for school where she is absolutely happy where the arts are part, are part of the whole picture at Raymond. Um, then I want to thank you because I am a member of the board of the Sitar Arts Center. Mm -hmm. In the past, Sitar could not get funding because somehow the government couldn't work out the way that they do arts. Um, and this year, through the programs that you've put in place, they've actually received funding from the DC government to provide arts programs and services to World One kids. So thank you on that front. You're welcome. Uh, it may have been through the Commission on Arts and Humanities, or it may have been through the one city. It, it uh, has to yeah. do with the government. I, I don't know the details, but I, I know that that a lot of work was done to open the process because mm -hmm. before there was a specific regimen that had to be followed and they didn't meet it because they did not have an overall after school program. And those are very key pieces. So along the lines of that, I'm also a parent of a child at Duke Ellington School of the Arts in the voice program. Um, and my child is going to be coming to Ward 1 because uh, Ellington is going to be worked on. Uh, so I wanted to make certain that the schools where they're going are going to be ready, that all of those pieces are going to be in place because high school is a, every, every step is a very valuable step. But for kids that are taxed with going to school from 8.30 to 5 p.m. every day, and then they have performances, it is, it is key it is totally key that they are able to function in a way where the building is totally ready for them to, to be able to perform, to get their classes, and get everything done. Lastly, uh, Mr. Mayor, wait, I know wait, that... Wait, wait a minute, Lisa. Uh, I mean, uh, Lillian, I'm going to ask Lisa Rue if she would address the issue you, ju you just uh, raised. Can, Where, where's the mic? Where can, was the mic that was over here? Mr. Mayor, can I just give the next piece just because... Uh, and then if... You, if just well, because I want to stop and, and not return. I, I was going to give. I was going to come back to you. I just want to let oh, her okay. answer that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Lisa Ruda. I'm the Deputy Chancellor for the District of Columbia Public Schools. Um, you're right on the money. We've got to get ready. We've got some great, exciting things going on. Ellington is going to start this summer for the next two years going under construction. And as the mayor talked about some of the hard decisions he's had to make with respect to the capital plan, Ellington itself started as an $80 million project, sir, when I started. And by the time we, we dealt with making sure that children have what they need at that building, it's now $140 million, and it's going to be this phenomenal state-of-the-art center to serve all of our children. Um, but for the next two school years, starting next year, you're absolutely right. The students from Ellington, so we can get the construction done as expeditiously as possible, will be at the Old Meyer, which is, which is right near Cardoza High School, and also down the street at the old Shaw, or at the current Shaw at Garnet Patterson. And we're working with the school to make sure that we've got got staff at both sites because now you go from one front office to two front offices. Um, we're talking about transportation and how to make this as successful as, as humanly possible. I'm going to be candid. Anytime there's change, it, it, it's, there's going to be some bumps in the road, mm -hmm. but with Principal Pullins, the entire staff, as well as the students, I'm expecting some really, really, really good things to happen with Ellington and hopefully, just like at Wilson, remember when Wilson moved over to UDC and everybody was on Connecticut Avenue and mm -hmm. and guess what we've been in the new Wilson building for a couple of years now and that just seems like we got through it and we Fantastic. got to a better yeah. end product so appreciate your patience in advance I think the entire Elling team is working super hard to, um, to to get us ready to make the transition as smooth as possible thank you I thank think you it's going to be the finest performing arts high school in America uh, when it's finished
Absolutely, and I think with that staff, and I, the, I think the chancellor and the mayor would clobber me if I didn't mention that this is, in fact, Teacher Appreciation Week. Yeah. So most folks don't have a favorite doctor, a favorite pharmacist, but they got a favorite teacher. And because of the man up front, we're adding 305 teachers to our school budgets next year. I don't know of a better way to appreciate teachers, so thank you. Now to the budget. The Children Youth Investment Trust, um, Mayor Gray, um, gives me a lot of pause in terms of what are we doing to ensure that our budgets are, in fact, having a solid impact on the lives of our children. And, why, um, and, and what is different between the Children Youth Investment Trust budget uh, that I noticed at a hearing there seems to be a lot of question about the, the board that all oversees that operation or was overseeing that operation in, uh, a, a little a while back. What is going on with that and how is that different from the monies that have been allocated to the Community Foundation, an organization that is meant to do that, that does that for that's their sole purpose? And how do we ensure that in the end our budgets are getting to where they need to be getting to, to the children overall and supporting learning after school and special events and things that are going to benefit the children? Thank you. All right, I'm going to ask uh, Deputy Mayor Otero if she would step up. And I think, I think there were several questions embedded in that. One was the distinction between the uh, CYITC and the uh, city fund. I, I can begin to answer that. The CYITC focuses on after-school uh, programming. That's what it was designed to do from its inception a number of years ago. And that's where the money uh, has been going. The uh, city fund, on the other hand, is much broader and focuses on a, not just a specific on populations. It focuses on specific issue areas um, like seniors, like education, and a host of other things. So they really are two different uh, uh, approaches. Um, and the uh, CYITC has been focusing a lot on um, helping to focus on some of the policy issues involving children uh, as well. Bibi, you want to talk, to talk about some of that? Oh, yeah, a couple of things. Um, I think in the last three years we've seen an amazing turnaround uh, with the trust, and um, they have been really pivotal to making sure that we coordinate across city agencies and community-based organizations as it regards to young people and out of school time and summer and, and, and so on. Um, so if, uh, if you have questions about where it is today versus where it was four years ago, I would really suggest that you look at their website and look at some of the uh, data and some of the information uh, that they've put out. The One City Youth uh, Initiative, which they have really been the primary coordinators, has uh, served over 19,000 kids over the summer uh, with uh, significant funding. Uh, aside from the $3 million that are in their line item in the budget, I think uh, the trust has gotten probably close to about $8 million for youth programming. Uh, the board has been totally overhauled between the appointments that the chairman, who was standing behind me two minutes ago, uh, <laughs> and the mayor have made, has overhauled that board. We have uh, the chair is Marie Johns, who everybody respects and knows very, very well in this city. We have people from, we have folks from the National Academy for Science. We have folks from the Center for the Study of Social Policy. So it's a very, very solid board of directors. Uh, we've just gotten an audit. One of the criticisms was that the audits were behind and not. We have clean audits for 2013. We've accomplished all the audits in 13, in, uh, for 10, 11, and 12. So the trust is really underway to be the organization and is the organization that, um, that uh, was uh, originally envisioned to be. And in fact, across the country, we are getting requests uh, to have them come and speak and talk about uh, this amazing public-private partnership that is the Children's Youth Investment Trust, city government, and community organizations. So I'm, I'm very, very pleased with where they've gotten this year. All right. Thank you all very much for coming out. We appreciate it. This is uh, a very energetic uh, meeting and some great questions and comments. Thank you all and good night.